Hey, this is Phil Diaz. I'm the pastor at Greencastle Church of the Nazarene, and this is our podcast. I want to thank you for joining us today. It's my prayer that God would use this podcast to speak to your life right where you're at. I pray it also builds your faith and helps give you perspective on how God can work, move, and transform your life. Enjoy the message. You know, it's so powerful to be able to think about what the blood of Jesus can do. Amen. You know, the blood of Jesus in the way that it was shed for you and me, in the way that it was given for you and me, in the way that it's still giving to you and me today, amen? Man, I, I just think about what the blood of Jesus can do. When, when you begin to think about that, it helps maybe bring that, that particular song to life. Because you see, the blood of Jesus was something that in the Old Testament it was coveted by the people, but, but, but they didn't have that. You see, they had to use the, the blood of a, of a lamb to be able to be sacrificed for the atonement of their sins. And what we have on this side of the cross is something so powerful and so special because we have the very blood of our Lord and Savior that covers you, that washes you, that cleanses you, Amen. You have the very blood of our Lord and Savior <laughs> that gives you access and not just some access, but gives you immediate access into the throne room, into the presence of Almighty God himself. What was reserved for special leaders in the Old Testament of Moses of being with God, and special prophets like Elijah and Elisha, what we have with the blood of Christ, we're able to go into the very throne room of God because of what Jesus has done. That's why in the scriptures it says that the curtain was torn asunder, is torn in two. Because there was no more division between man and God because of what the blood of Jesus has done. So this morning as we stand here together today, I just want us to be grateful for the gift of the blood of Jesus because it was all given by this big word right here, amazing grace. Amazing grace. So this morning, I just, I feel the Lord's presence and I just simply, I just want to be obedient to that. I just want us to bow our heads in this moment, just take a posture of humility just take a posture of just humbleness. And let's just go before our God here today. Let's, let's, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, man, there is just not enough songs, there's not enough words that we can simply say that we can utter that really tell you how much we appreciate the gift of the blood of Jesus Christ within our lives. There's not enough that, that we can put and string together to Lord to say thank you. But God, we, as your humble servants here today, we've come to worship you. We've come to join together as an echo of a song of worship and of unity, Father. We come together because we are all brought together by the blood of Jesus Christ. We're all brought here together today because of what you did on the cross. We're all brought here together today from all different parts of this land. But we come together today, this Sunday morning, here at Green Castle. Church of the Nazarene, we come together today to give you worship and praise, and adoration, and thankfulness for your blood. God, may we never forget the things that you've done for us. Because as humans, I know, Lord, we have to be reminded a lot. Right now, I know there's some of us, we're just already thinking about the next thing, the next thing, and the next thing. And and so, God, will you still our hearts to be able to be within this moment, to be in a way that we just focus everything on you. 
that we focus our hearts, that you, you turn our, 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 our minds around, Lord, that you shake all the distractions away, Father, that you, you give us this time, Lord, to focus on you, focus on your word, focus on, on being in your presence, Lord, the thing that, that was so craved for by so many in, in, in the Old Testament, God, we have access to that today, we have access to that right now, and, and it's truly a, a beautiful gift. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord, for the blood that was shed. Lord, I come before you today. And, and Lord, I, I know that this Sunday there, there's people that are just seeking and, and looking for, for you in maybe a new way to, to be strengthened, Lord, in the faith, Lord, to, to be able to develop themselves in such a way, Lord, to where they, they just want more of you. And God, I believe that with all of your might, with all of your power, Lord, that you want to come before us today and to, and to, to grant that to us. But, but Lord, will you be able to, to move us and transform us in your will, in your way, and within your time? And Lord, if you will, take this time that we have here together today and move us closer into your presence. Lord, we love you. I pray for those here today that just, Lord, maybe they just need to know that, how much you love them. So, Lord, will you grant that prayer, help people know how much that they are truly loved by you. I pray for those here today that are struggling. I pray for those here today that need a touch from you, Father. Spiritually, they're struggling, Father. Maybe physically, they're struggling. Maybe within the confines of, of, of their mental and emotional states, Father, they're just struggling. And, and God, they'll never say that they're actually struggling, but you know the hearts of every single person that's gathered here together today. And what I believe you want us to hear is that there is grace for us here today. And so we pray this in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. We pray and say, Amen. 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 Thank you, Lord for what you're doing here today. Amen. Amen. Well, I welcome you once again to Green Castle Church of the Nazarene. And this is a place where we love God, we love people, and we want to make disciples. Church, how are you doing today? Good. Amen. <laughs> Amen. I'm excited to be here. Are you excited to be here? Good. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Give him praise again. <laughs> there you go. Well, I do want to welcome you all once again to our service. I want to also give a quick shout out to our eFam that is watching online. I want to say, hi, eFam. Hi, eFam. Amen. If you're watching online, you can drop us a comment in the chat. Let us know how we can best connect with you and also pray for you. Well, today's message title is this. Are you ready for it? It's called Living in God's Abundant Grace. Amen. 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 Living in God's abundant grace. So I want you to turn to your neighbor today and say, neighbor, neighbor. you're living in God's abundant grace. You're living in God's abundant grace. Now turn to your other neighbor and just do this. You heard me the first time. <laughs> Amen. All right. So let me ask you something, church. Has there ever been a time in your life Okay, you got to be honest with yourself. Has there ever been a time in your life where you felt like you were just completely far away from God? Amen. And you felt like there was just no way you could ever come back to him. Okay, yes. have you ever felt that? Yeah. I have. I felt that in my life. I want to confess that. <laughs> I felt that in my life. I felt this before. When I was... A younger man, I was kind of in between this, this time in my life where I could do the church stuff and do it on autopilot, right? I could look the part, say the right things, do the right things, all on the outside. But on the inside, there was something not connecting the way it should, okay? Okay. And so church, I, I want to tell you here today that the worst thing that can happen to you in this moment, in this church service, is that you leave the same way that you came in. Amen? Amen. 
All right? Because I believe that God is wanting to do some amazing things here at Greencastle Church of Nazarene, here in this time together. Amen? Amen. Do you believe that? Yes. Amen. Amen. So here's the thing, church. I don't believe any one of us is here by accident today. I don't believe that you're just here on a whim. All right? Now, I believe that you're here because you have a divine appointment with God. And God has you right where he wants to be able to speak to you. Where he maybe even wants to do something through you that just might blow your mind and change your perception on what he can really do. The question, of course, is this. Are you going to let him? Are you going to let God work in your life here today, church? Amen? Amen. Amen. All right, that's what we're here for, right? Amen. So today, here's what we're going to do. We're going to start by standing and we're going to be reading the Word of God here together today. Um, this is a little bit lengthier of a passage, but um, I would love for us to stand out of reverence for the reading of the Word of the Lord. All right. And so we're going to be in Luke and we're going to be in chapter 15. And we're going to read a famous story here today from Luke 15, 11 through 32. This is the parable of the lost son. And so Jesus was talking to his disciples and he was explaining some things that were lost. He had talked about uh, a widow and the lost coins and, and lost sheep. Now he was talking about a story about the lost son. So we're just going to kind of dig into this here today and see what the Lord has for us. It says here, Jesus continued, <clears throat> there was a man who had two sons. And the younger one said to his father, father, give me my share of the estate. And so he divided his property between them. How nice of him. Verse 13. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there he squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. And so he went and he hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. How many of you have ever fed pigs before? Raise your hand. All right, that's not a fun job, is it? Okay. Verse 16, he longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating. Yeah, that's got to be bad when the pig's food is looking that good. But nonetheless... He, fill, he longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. <laughs> and when he came to his senses, in verse 17, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am, I'm starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. Interesting proposition, isn't it? So in verse 20, so he got up and he went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, he threw his arms around him, and he kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, and I love them, he said, Quick, bring the best robe, put it on him. Put a ring on his finger, put sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Because we're going to have a feast and celebrate. <laughs> For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And so they begun, they began to celebrate. Verse 25. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. And when he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. And so he called one of the servants and asked him, what is going on? And he said, your brother has come, he replied, and, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. And the older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and he pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, 
all these years I've been slaving for you and you never disobeyed your orders. You never even gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. My friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill a fattened calf for him? Interesting question. Verse 31. My son, the father said, you're always with me. And everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate. And we be and we had to be glad. Because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost. And now he's found. Amen. 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 Let's give God praise for that. Amen. Well, let's bow our heads for just a moment here today and receive this word. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the way in which your presence is moved. We are grateful for the way in which, Lord, we just can connect to this story in one way or the other. So, Father, I'm praying for all of us here today to find somewhere that we can connect with in this message. But most importantly, Lord, I'm praying, Lord, that this message and the words I say, Lord, may they be a reflection of what your heart is. And I'm praying, Lord, for your will and your way to be done within this word here today. May this be the spiritual sustenance, Lord, that we need. And may this be the spiritual sustenance, Lord, that you help feed to us here today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You guys may be seated here today. Wow, living in God's abundant grace. What a story, right? So the first thing I want to look at here today is, of course, the prodigal son and God's unconditional grace. All right, so to help bring this home, I want you to turn to your neighbor and say, God gives unconditional grace. Amen. Amen. So when we look at this story of the prodigal son, we look at the son and his initial decision. And this was what it was. It's essentially here is this young man who went to his father and simply said this, Dad! How many of you have ever heard that in your life? Dad! 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 I hear that from Liam. He says, Daddy. <laughs> And this son, he says, Dad, I can't wait for you to die so you can give me my inheritance. Ching. It's such a nice, nice thing to say, isn't it? And so the son packed his bags, he took his inheritance, and of course, he headed out to a far distant land. And, and in the distant land, he was far from the wisdom and influence of the man that he called Dad. And church, how often do we do the same thing? Hmm? How often do we ignore the wisdom of God's holy word? How often do we ignore the guidance of the Holy Spirit? And sometimes we just think, nah, I got this. I'm good. I'm going. <laughs> I'm going to do it my way. <laughs> and that's what this prodigal son did. And you see, the scripture then tells us that not long after that, the prodigal son began to squander everything. Everything. I want you to know that the inheritance that he has, it, it was quite a bit. So to put it into perspective, it would be having basically your house paid for, car paid for. You get what I'm sensing, right? Okay. It would be quite a bit to live off on. I wouldn't say maybe the rest of your life, but you could definitely start a really good life with it, okay? That's his portion of the inheritance. So in a matter of time, it was all gone, all right? He had made some friends, probably bought them a round of drinks, and another round, and another round. He made some other friends. He bought them some clothes. He made some other friends to buy companionship with. And then he made some other friends to take them home. You see what I'm getting at, right? The scripture tells us that eventually a famine came and it hit. 
And then the same prodigal son, who had squandered everything away in a very short amount of time, began to find himself feeding pigs because he needed a job. You see, the lifestyle that he was used to, he could no longer now afford, right? It's like someone winning the lottery and saying a million dollars isn't enough for me to live on. I mean, how many of you, <laughs> let me just ask you, how many of you would love to just live on a million dollars alone, okay? Yeah. Now, let, let me just say it this way. When you live past your means, the quick answer is, I always just need more, right? And because he didn't have his father, he didn't learn a thing called management, amen? So this famine hits, and he finds himself feeding pigs, which in Jewish culture, by the way, the pig was one of the most unclean, if not the most unclean animal that you could ever be around, you could even touch. But here he was, he was feeding the pigs, and he was doing this just to survive. And the reason he was doing that is because he hit a place, and that place is called Rock Bottom. Let me ask you, church, how many of you have ever been to Rock Bottom? Rock Bottom, right? Rock Bottom is where you see that sin promises complete freedom. Ah, oh, I can do whatever I want. Yeah. But the freedom that you think you're getting into, that you think that you're buying into, it's really not freedom, it's just another prison. It's just another piece of slavery that keeps you chained to an addiction, keeps you chained to a lifestyle, it keeps you chained to be in the faraway land, far away from God. You see, when you hit rock bottom, it promises success, but it always delivers failure. And when you hit rock bottom, it promises life, but only once death. This is rock bottom. Now, I'm going to ask you, how many of you have hit rock bottom in your life? The question that's always posed is, well, how did I get here? <laughs> and so this is really where the story becomes interesting. And I'm hoping that somehow maybe speaks to someone here in the room today. You see, in verse 17, it said that the prodigal son eventually had to do something. In verse 17, it says that when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? Here I am, I'm starving to death. You see, this is where the story of grace begins to envelop. You see, this is a turning point. For this prodigal son. You see, the prodigal son even realized that even in the lowest place of his father's house, which was a servant, the lowest servant, not even the butler servant, I'm talking about the lowest servant, it was better living as a low servant than it would ever be trying to feed these pigs for the rest of his life. It would be better than getting your hands dirty every day and lusting after the food that the pigs are eating. That's bad. That is rock bottom. Here's the thing, church. Sometimes it takes us getting to rock bottom for us to be able to look up. Sometimes it takes hitting that place for us to be able to remember how good God can be. Sometimes it takes us hitting rock bottom to understand the Father and His mercy and grace. And so here, the son, he decided to go back to his father. But in his mind, he's already thinking, I'm not even going to be his son. I'm just going to be his servant. I'm not going to be his son. I'm just going to be his servant. I'm not worthy to be his son. I'm just going to be a servant. I've screwed up. I've messed up. I've squandered it all. I don't have a chance. And there's no way that my dad will ever take me back as being his son. I'm only going to be the lowest of the low. I'm never going to be even up to the status that I was going to be the lowest of the low. But in the story, we see that something else happens. 
What does the father do? You see, while he was long, long, long away, the father saw him. And this is the point of the story that's so powerful. Because the father didn't say, when he gets here, I'm going to tell him exactly how I feel. How dare he? Hmm? How many of you would wrestle with some of those emotions? How dare my son come back to me? How dare he? <laughs> but what does it say? It is something crazy. It says the father saw him and he ran right to him. If you have ever had a child in your life that's just gone astray, who got lost and they couldn't be found, wouldn't you be running as well? Hmm? That's what the father did. Here's the thing. In the Middle East, especially in this culture, this was highly unusual. In a household where a man such as this, who was well off, well to do, it was very unusual to ever see an older man run, especially to another man, to another person. And the reason for that is, is because part of being the head of the household was that you didn't have to. That's why you had servants. That's why you had other hands to help do that job. But you see, the father, he didn't care. He begins to run. <laughs> In fact, here he is, and he's lifting his rope. He's running. He's going after his son. And so then the question is, well, why? And that's because this. I want you to know this, church. Love always outruns shame at every single turn. Amen? Amen. Amen. Love always outruns shame at every single turn. And so the father, he didn't just stop either just welcoming him. He put his best robe on him. He put a ring on his finger and he put sandals on his feet. It wasn't just a welcoming party. It's a restoration of his position as being his son. It's a restoration of his son's dignity, and it's a restoration of his belonging, of saying, you belong with me. I don't care how far you ran. I don't care how much you screwed up. I don't care how much you lost. You belong with me. Church, this is the grace of God that runs after you, that speaks to us here today. Church, this is a grace that doesn't just merely forgive. It restores you to the rightful place of being a child of the King. Amen? Amen. Wow. And here's the other thing. It doesn't just save us either. It does something more than that. It saves us for something greater. Amen. Saves you for something greater. Give God praise for that. Amen. Amen. Here's the thing. There's a lot to learn from the prodigal son about God's unconditional grace. Because grace can meet you and can meet me where sometimes we don't even deserve it. Grace forgives and restores and propels us into our purpose. But I want you to know this, church. Grace is not just a one-time event and period in your life. It's an ongoing reality that empowers you to live a life that glorifies God and a life that propels you into His holiness, into His love, into things, into your life that you could never do on your own because it all starts with the grace of God. You see, God's grace isn't just available to you. It's more than that. It's a grace that's available to you and a grace that once when received, it's unstoppable.
for those who have their hearts, their minds, and their lives given into the Lord. Give him praise if you have experienced his unconditional grace this morning. Amen. Amen. Now I want to look at my next point. Mm. There's another person in the story that had a very interesting story as well. So I want to also look at the older brother and God's inclusive grace. But what does that mean? That sounds like a fancy theology term paper. Well, I'm going to get a little fancy on you today. Is that okay? Man, no okay. It's all right. But this is what I want to talk about here. The older brother, God's inclusive grace. Turn to your neighbor and say, God gives inclusive grace. God gives inclusive grace. Okay. So as we see in the story, the story unfolds. We find that there's an older brother in the story that is working in the field. He's working diligently. And he's been uh, presumably doing this for a long time. He's the kid that's consistent. All right? Now, if you're a parent, you kind of understand some of your children. There's some of your children that are a little wishy-washy on certain things, right? And then you have some of the kids that you know that they're consistent. You know that they're going to talk to you on a Tuesday at 3.30 p.m. You know that they're going to be able to be at the family gathering. You know that you can depend on them if you had a task at hand to do. How many of you parents have understand that, right? Okay. <clears throat> So, the older brother, he hears of this crazy celebration that's going on. And then his curiosity, it begins to turn to indignation. And you're like, well, what is that? It means he's getting a little bit upset with what he's hearing. Have you ever felt a sense of <clears throat> righteous indignation? Right? What does that look like? It looks like, hmm. Doesn't God see me doing everything right on this side of the cross, right? Why is he blessing them over there? I know that they didn't tithe last week. I know that they didn't pray. I know they didn't do this. I know they didn't do that. God, I'm doing it all. Look at me. I'm so good. <laughs> I've been so consistent. <clears throat> and this is kind of what the problem is with the older brother. He begins to think a little highly of himself, right? And so, here he is, thinking, man, I've been doing everything right. Why is God blessing him? Why is he not blessing me? And then, you just see the attitude begin to creep up within him. And then the older brother begins to believe that his loyalty and his hard work have, have really earned him something. He begins to talk to his father like this. He says, look, all these years I've been slaving for you. Maybe. You know, it's what Ashley normally says. Sass, leave it outside. <laughs> That's a little sassy to me. But then the older brother, he begins to <coughs> see this transactional view of grace. Basically, there are some people in life that look at God's grace like this. I did this, and it can be X, Y, Z, P, D, Q. I did this, so God, you owe me that. See that? It's what we call transactional grace. It's where you begin to take grace into your own hands and say, I did this, so therefore I deserve this. I deserve that. I deserve what they got. Thing is, church, how often do we really fall into that trap and we treat God like some sort of cosmic vending machine? Huh? Right? How often do we fall into the trap where, where we just treat God like, like he's just a couple of buttons that we push and we get like a bag of Doritos out of them? Huh? The truth of this church is this. God's grace is not transactional. Amen? And I'm so glad for that. Because there's not enough good things that I could do to earn his favor. In fact, in the scriptures, it says that grace is relational. Because grace is poured out on you right here, right now, whether you want it or not. Amen? Amen? 
You get grace. The person in the back to the person in the front to the person on the side and the other side. Guess what? Everyone's getting grace in this place today. Amen? Give them praise. You see, the father's response to the older son, if we study it, it's full of grace. He begins to welcome the prodigal son and he says, my son, you're always with me and everything I have is yours. You see, when he begins to speak this way to the older brother, what we learn is that the father is showing inclusive grace. Grace isn't just for the prodigal. Grace isn't just for the messed up person in our lives. God's grace isn't just for that person who is so far away from God. Grace is for you and it's for me. He wants to include, which means it's inclusive. He wants to include all of us in his grace. Grace is for the outcast just as much as it is for the insider. Grace is for the saint just as much as it is for the one who is strayed far from home. Grace is for all. Amen? And so here we have the older brother. And the tragedy of this is that the older brother had spent the most time in his father's house. Right? He is the consistent one. He was the one working. He was there all the time. But what did the older brother not have by being in the father's house? You see, he missed out on having the father's heart. He had access to everything, but enjoyed nothing. And the reason why is because he failed to grasp that grace was already his. I'm going to say that again. Grace was already his. Sometimes the danger for us on this side of the cross, sometimes in the ones that have been in the church the longest, what I would call some of the older brothers or maybe sisters in the churches, sometimes that we can be that, that church every Sunday. We can be involved in, in all these ministries, and yet we can still miss the heart of God. The heart of God, which is full of truth and full of grace, and yet also full of love, is for all. You see, God's grace is not a limited resource that we need to be able to compete for. It's not a limited resource that like, oh, we better stop digging for God's grace. It's going to run out. God's grace is an infinite gift and treasure for every single person. It's not earned by your merits. It's not earned by what you do. It's freely given through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. The precious blood of Jesus. And this grace is for everyone. So today, we need to be grateful. Let's give God praise. If you have felt, if you have experienced, and if you are in his inclusive grace, Give him praise for that today. Amen. And now we come to this. The father, the lavishing father, and God's reconciling grace. So I want you to turn to your neighbor and say, God gives reconciling grace. See, you're going to learn some new words today, okay? <laughs> so, my last point, I just simply want to take a look at the Father. You know, after distributing the inheritance, he loses his one son to a reckless life of living. And then he loses another son, really, to bitterness and self righteousness. Yet the Father is an interesting character because the Father remains steadfast for both, amen? And the Father in this story embodies God, who is constant, whose love is unchanging for you and for me, which is the foundation of grace. And the Father shows us that there's two kinds of grace. One, there's provenient grace. What's that? That's another big word. It's just simply the grace that goes before. It shows you the signs of what God is able to do. It shows you the signs of what God's grace can be like in your life. 
And then, I believe in the story, he's also wanting to show us reconciling grace. A grace that heals relationships. And as we see in the father's interaction with his older son, he leaves the party and he pleads with him and he tries to bring him into the celebration. You see, this is the kind of grace that's all about restoration. Amen? How many of you are grateful that God doesn't just leave you where you're at and gives you grace? He brings you into his house. Amen? Amen. Amen. And then he doesn't just bring you into the house. He lets you know that you're part of the family. Amen? Amen. Give God praise for that. Amen? <clears throat> so in the story, we see the father. You can imagine he's just standing with his arms wide open. He wasn't waiting for the prodigal son to come to him. He ran to his son. And his grace is an open invitation. It's available and it's extended. This is the same kind of grace that God gives to you here today. Running towards you. I don't care where you've been. I don't care what you've done. I'm going to love you. You see, God isn't just the God of a second chance. He's the God of endless chances in your life. So church, as we look at the Father, I want you to know this. The Father's actions are a template really for the church. You see, His house became a place of celebration. When someone was lost, they celebrated. When someone was brought back, they celebrated. They made him part of the household. You see, this reflects the heart of God for what the church can be. A community where grace abounds, where, where prodigals and older brothers <laughs> in our lives can experience the same reconciling love and grace of God. Amen? And so the grace of God, it's not just a solitary experience. You see, the grace of God is something that we can also all experience together here as a community of faith. And it reconciles us vertically to God as well as horizontally to one another. Huh. And this is the full expression of His grace. That it reconciles, it restores, it brings you together from rock bottom into the household and being a child of God. That is so good. Give God praise for that. So this morning, I just simply just want us to be able to, in our hearts and lives, examine. I know there's a lot that we've unpacked today. And as we dig into the word of God, I just believe that God is wanting to speak to us in this moment. <laughs> and so I think it's good for us to be able to we're going to just kind of put our hearts on our sleeves for just a moment because I don't want anyone leaving this place today to know that they are not loved you are I don't want anyone to leave this place today to know that there is not grace for you there's, there's grace from God here for you there is mercy. There is forgiveness. I also want you to know that no one is too far gone. And at the same time, I also want you to know this. No one is too good to not need it either. If you find yourself relating to one of these characters today, maybe... Maybe it's the prodigal son. Maybe in your life you just feel like you've squandered opportunity. Maybe you've just been running from God. The good news is this. God's waiting for you. He's sprinting towards you this morning. Maybe you relate to the older brother. Or maybe older, you're an older sister in the house. and You know, you got your act together. And you've been doing all the right things. But there's something that's not quite right, maybe deep down within you. 
Sometimes we get pretty prideful as Christians and we think, I don't need the grace of God. I got all of this faith and religious stuff and Bible stuff. I got it all figured out. I don't really need God's grace. But here's the news flash. You see, grace isn't just for the prodigals. It's also for you. Grace is not a crutch for weakness. Grace is the power of God working in all of us. Today the Father is here. So here's what I'd like us to do to close. I'd like all of us to come up front today. We also have seats available for those who I know that have some mobility issues, so please take a seat if that's what you need. But today, I don't think there's anyone in this house who doesn't need grace. Amen? Amen. Prove me wrong. But there's no one in this house that doesn't need the grace of God. So I'd like us to come up front. We're going to fill our altars up here together today. And I just want us to be able to embrace the grace that God gives to all of us here today together. Does that, does that make sense to everyone? All right. So everyone, let's just come up front here today. We can get more chairs if need be. Okay. And if someone's at an altar, you can just stand behind them or take a seat. Whatever is good for you. I just want you to, in this moment, be able to find a posture of worship. If someone's there praying, maybe you can lay a hand on them, okay? Let's just join together. I'm going to lead us through a prayer, okay? And I just want you to repeat what I said in this prayer. Let's bow our heads and let us pray. Say, Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus, Thank you, God, for your grace. Thank you, God, for your grace. We come together. We come together. As a family of God. As a family of God. A family that you put together. A family that you put together. And we come and want to give you thanks. And we come and we want to give you thanks. Lord, as we come together. Lord, as we come together. Examine our hearts. Examine our hearts. Examine our thoughts. Examine our thoughts. Examine our ways. Examine our ways. Show me. Show me how your grace, how your grace works, works in every part, in every part of my life. Of my life. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. For bringing me. For bringing me closer. Closer. Into your presence. Into your presence. Where you give me, where you give me infinitely more, infinitely more than I could ever ask, than I could ever ask or imagine, or imagine. Amen. 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 Let's give God praise here, church. As everyone that's just gathered here, I just simply want to say this in closing: Don't leave this place here today without knowing. God loves you. He pours his grace out on you. You guys are dismissed here today. Hey, thank you so much for listening to our podcast today. If you would like to connect with me or Greencastle Church of the Nazarene, you can find us on Facebook at Greencastle Nazarene 
and also on our website, www.greencastlenazarene.com. May you have a blessed and wonderful day in the Lord.